Well, the Bible says that whatever you do for the least of these, you've done for me. And those are the words of Jesus. One thing that we can do in being the hands and feet of Jesus and in bringing his justice to those who might be marginalized or hurting or have less perhaps, is to just have something like a food pantry or a clothes closet in which we can donate to, in which we can give to, in which we can be a part of reaching out to other people to share the love of Christ through our actions. Even if it's just a handout of food that might help them get through the week or the month, or whether it's some clothes that might help them with a job interview. There's a lot of generosity, there's a lot of kindness, and there's a lot of people who care. And you would be surprised at the people who are just, who give back. They get in a, a bind, and then they come back when they get their feet on the ground and say, here, I want to help. I want to give back because you helped me two months ago, or you helped me last week. The Bible says, you know, to take care of those who um, are in need, and I'm just so thankful that our church um, provides us with the opportunity. There's just so much need around here. I mean, even in this beautiful place, there's people that are homeless, there's people that don't, don't have enough money. People just thank us for a bag of groceries. They just go, thank you. They thank us for clothes. It's just to help, it's just to give back. And if you're interested in being part of these ministries, of being part of the clothes closet or the food pantry, there's several things you can do. One, of course, is to donate. We have two white bins right in front of our clothes closet and our food pantry trailer that you can come down and you can drop stuff off on during the week, or you can bring things on a Sunday and we'll gladly take them. But also you can give not only of your stuff, but you can give of your time. We would love to have people that can join our team, that can be part of our food pantry or our clothes closet, that can meet the people that come, that can greet them, that can welcome them, that can pray with them, that can help us to organize the supplies and the food and the clothes. That would be something that we would greatly appreciate you praying about and considering. And if you'd like to do that, please contact food pantry at shorelinechurch.org. pays attention. They listen to what other people say, and they respond accordingly. A, a wise student, whether you're a high school student or college or doing master's work, a wise student listens to their teacher and figures out what they value. If you have a teacher who values all the small details in the reading, then you read all the reading closely, and you watch for the details, and when the test comes, and they have all these obscure questions for the reading, you're like, I got it, because you paid attention, and you responded accordingly. Uh, a smart employee pays attention to what their boss values. If you have a boss who values being there on time, and you come in 10 minutes late consistently, you're just not thinking. You're not exercising wisdom. You get there 10 minutes early. If they value being there on time, get there early. And they're like, man, you're a hero. You're the best. A wise husband <laughs> pays attention to their wife, listens to their wife, and responds accordingly. I found out early on by trial and error that my wife really values her birthday. Not the birthday week, the birthday. So I make a big deal on September 7th every year because that matters to her. And she, she doesn't need a lot. She just needs me to remember her on that day. A wise person understands that. And if you're a wise follower of Jesus, you listen to the heart of the Father. Say, what is God saying? What does God long for? And you respond accordingly. Listen to these words from Micah chapter 6. We're in the series on the minor prophets. Uh, last year we covered six of the minor prophets. This year we're covering the rest of the minor prophets. And today we're focusing on the prophecy of Micah. Just seven chapters, a small prophecy of Micah. But in Micah 6, 8, we read these words. He has shown you, O mortal, he has shown you, O man or O woman, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? Oh, you pay attention. Okay, we're going to hear what God requires, what God wants from us. He has shown you, O mortal, what is good and what does the Lord require of you? To act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. To love justice, to do what is right. To be merciful and compassionate. And to walk every day humbly with God. That's one of, the, one of the primary 
lessons from the heart of God. And it comes right here from this book of Micah, this minor prophet, this little seven-chapter book that, that teaches us amazing things. And so I want you to get to know Micah a little bit and know about Micah. Micah had an incredible heart for the poor. He had a passion for the poor. He cared about the broken and the marginalized and the forgotten. You know, when we do a food pantry, a clothing closet, a lot of our ministries in our community, it's because the heart of God is for those who don't have, and so we seek to provide with the grace and the love of Jesus. Micah was a simple and common person. He, he didn't come from a fancy background, highly educated. He prophesied in the time of Isaiah. Isaiah had the best Hebrew in all of the Bible, highly scholarly, educated. Micah wasn't like that. He was kind of a common person. But Micah, and I love this, Micah was brutally honest. I mean, he said it like it was, and he brought it. I love people like that. I go crazy with people who beat around the bush and don't say what they're thinking. I like people to just say it. So I love Micah because he's brutally honest, but he's also compassionate, and he lifted people up. What a combination to be brutally clear and honest and compassionate. Listen closely. That's, that's allowed. <laughs> you can be direct and bold and honest and also tender and compassionate. And Micah brought those two characteristics together. His name means who is like the Lord. Isn't that a great name? Who is like the Lord? The answer is no one is like the Lord. The Lord is God. That was his name. To understand Micah's prophecy, you have to understand the context he lived in his setting. His ministry pointed to the fall of the northern kingdom, and he saw the fall of the northern kingdom. Now, if you don't know this part of the world, in the ancient world, I'll give you a snapshot. You know, here's the Mediterranean Sea right here. And here's, here's the Sea of Galilee, and then running down the Jordan River to the Dead Sea. And this area here, the northern and southern kingdom, this was all where God's people, where the 12 tribes of God's people united. But as we shared a couple weeks ago, they went through a civil war. They were divided. And here's the dividing line between the southern kingdom of, uh, I mean, sorry, the northern kingdom of Israel and the southern kingdom of Judah. And so here's the thing about Micah. Micah lived, he came from the southern kingdom. He prophesied down in the southern kingdom, but he prophesied about the northern kingdom. Also down here, but primarily he was saying in the northern, people in the north, and he was saying, actually, you are being unjust, you're being merciless, you are not following God, and if you keep on that path, judgment's gonna come. He actually said a nation, the Assyrians from the north, are gonna come down, and they're gonna invade, and they're gonna take your capital, Samaria. So you, so you need to repent, or if you don't repent, trouble's coming. And, and, and so he gives, he gives this bold declaration and he lets them know that they need to seek the face of God. They need to turn it. And if they don't, they're going to come on hard, hard times. And, and so, so it's also important to notice in Micah's day, Micah prophesied from 740 B.C. to 710 B.C. So for about 30 years, he was a prophet. And one of the, like the key dates in all the history of the Old Testament is this date, 722 B.C. Because in 722 B.C., the Assyrians came down from the north they destroyed Samaria, the capital of the northern kingdom, 10 of the tribes of God's people, and took them away into captivity. 722 B.C. He prophesied from 740 to 710. So in the midst of his prophetic ministry, the thing he prophesied would happen actually happened right then in his own lifetime. And, and so he had this powerful ministry. And, and when we look at the book of Micah, this, this great book of the Bible, and I love the minor prophets, I see at least four major lessons, like big themes, major lessons that we need to let get into our hearts and into our minds and learn from the prophecy of Micah. And here's major lesson number one. God wants his servants to be tenacious truth tellers. He, God wants his people to be committed, tenacious, truth-telling people. In a world of lots of lies, in a world of falsehoods, in a world of fake news, in a world where people don't think that they even know what the truth is anymore, God says, there is truth, and I want my people to speak the truth, and, and yet to do it with a graciousness. Listen to these words from Micah 3, 5. He's talking about prophets who are prophesying lies, and he says this. This is what the Lord says. As for the prophets who lead my people astray, false prophets, false teachers, they proclaim peace if they are getting something to eat. But prepare to wage war against anyone who refuses to feed them. You get the picture? It says these false prophets will say, got some food? Got some money? Got a little payola? Give it to me? Okay. Hey, everything's gonna be great in your life. Peace, peace, peace. Everything's fine. Got some food? Got some payola? No? Hey, war, famine, and hard times for you. They would prophesy based on how people would pay them off. Can I give you a warning? Can I give you a warning? Beware of any pastor who always tells you what you wanna hear. Who have any pastor who every single Sunday you leave feeling like I'm wonderful and everything's perfect in my life. 
You got to be challenged sometimes. Amen? That was pretty decent for a you got to be challenged inv invitation, right? <laughs> yeah, I mean, if you're, the, the truth, sometimes the truth is tough. And, and we need to hear the truth. In a time of relativism, God wants us to speak the truth and to speak it with clarity. I grew up in a family uh, that really was a truth-telling family. It wasn't a church family, but a truth-telling family. One of the big lines of my family was this, in conversations. Here's one of our big family lines. I couldn't disagree with you more. <laughs> I heard many times family members to each other. And I've said it many times to my parents and other people. We, we tried to speak the truth to each other. I remember in my junior high years, we had different guys that would come and live with us. We called them the lost boys. But when somebody was in need, my family would invite them in. We had a guy that was living with us in, in, a, in a guest room, a guy named Eric. And he was in high school, and he was always leaving money laying around. Well, I'm a junior high kid. I had no money. I wanted to do something. I went and took some money from his room. Just took it and st I stole it. Junior high kid. And when I was a kid, if I got caught, I got in trouble. And I did a lot of things to get in trouble. I just didn't get caught very often. But when I got caught, I got in trouble. In this case, I got caught. My dad calls me into his room. And I knew two things were coming when I went to my dad's bedroom for a discipline time. I knew the hardest, most painful things. We'd sit on the edge of the bed, and he would talk to me. That was the hardest part. And then I knew he would paddle me. That was easy compared to the talking to. That's back in the paddling days. But he would paddle me after he talked to me. So he sat me on the edge of his bed. And he said, Kevin, you stole from Eric, didn't you? And I said, yeah, I did. He said, what do you call someone who steals? I said, a thief. And my dad looked at me and he said these words. He looked at me and he said, you are a thief. And I will treat you like a thief until you prove otherwise. It's one of the best things my dad ever said to me. It was true. And I wanted to show him that that's not who I was. We speak the truth. And, and Micah says, be a truth teller. Don't always say what people want to hear. That's one of the big lessons is be a committed, tenacious truth teller. Major lesson number two from Micah. God wants us to hold to hope even in times of judgment. Even when there's judgment, even when there's pain, even when times seem to be their worst, hold on to hope. And so right in, in Micah where he's talking about the sins of the northern kingdom and what's going to happen and the sins of the southern kingdom and that there's, that there's judgment and there's consequences for our sins, in the midst of all of that, there's still these words of hope. That God has something planned that's beyond what you're experiencing now and it's going to be glorious and good and you should live with hope even in the hard times. Even when righteous judgment comes, God still has a plan that goes beyond that that's better than that. So in Micah 4, verses 1 and 2, we read this. In the last days, the mountain of the Lord's temple will be established as the highest of the mountains. It will be exalted above the hills, and the peoples will stream to it. Many nations will come and say, come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the temple of the God of Jacob. He will teach us his ways so that we may walk in his paths. The law will go out from Zion the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. There will come a day when things will be restored, where hope will come back again, and you can walk in hope. And our world today needs hope. We need to live and walk in hope. And Micah shows us that even in the toughest of times, God is still a God of hope. I sat in a memorial service this last week with Sherry at First Baptist Church in Houston, Texas, for a young man, Nabil Qureshi. Nabil, who many of you know, who he preached here, was part of our, kind of our church family. He had made Monterey kind of his home when he was traveling all over the world to speak, but this was kind of the place he called home. So many of you knew him. And we sat there, and it was, it was painful and hard, and it was glorious and hopeful. Because Nabil lived for Jesus, died in faith, and went to be with Jesus. Our heartache is for Michelle and for Ian, for his family. And so we, we, we walked through this, this service, and there was a sense of loss and pain and difficulty, and yet God is on the throne, and there is hope. There's always hope. And, and for Christians, it is the hope of heaven, the hope of eternity, and I have no question that I will see Nabil face to face again because he is my brother. And we live and we walk in that hope. We hold to it. Micah tells us there's hope even in the toughest of times. Lesson number three from Micah. God wants people to embrace Jesus, the Messiah. Micah prophesies the coming of the Messiah, the coming of Jesus. And, and Micah has a sense of the one will come. It's, still, it's gonna be 700 years away, but he's pointing to this one who will come. It's in Micah that we read these words in chapter five, verses two to four. But you, Bethlehem, this, this, is, where, this is old little town of Bethlehem where Jesus was born. 
But you, Bethlehem, though you are small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come for me one who will be ruler over Israel, whose origins are from old, from ancient times. Therefore, Israel will be abandoned until the time when she who is in labor bears a son, and the rest of his brothers will return to join the Israelites. He, this is pointing to the Messiah, he will stand and shepherd his flock, the good shepherd Jesus, in the strength of the Lord, in the majesty of the Lord, the name of the Lord his God. And they will live securely, for then his greatness will reach to the ends of the earth. Micah gives this hope of a coming Messiah, that Jesus will come, God from heaven. He will live a life with no sin. He will die on the cross for our sins, in our place, bearing our shame and our punishment. And he will die paying the price. And he will rise again in glory. And Micah points to this coming Messiah born in Bethlehem. There is one named Jesus, and he is the hope of the world. Major lesson number four from Micah. God wants real faith and not empty religion. Boy, Micah makes it clear. Not just going through the routine, showing up at church, put a couple bucks in the offering plate, done with it for the week. He wants real faith that changes our lives, not just empty religion. In Micah 6, 6 to 8, we read this. With what shall I come before the Lord and bow down before the exalted God? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings? Implied no. Calves a year old? Implied no. That's not, that's not, that's, you know, offerings are great, but he says that's not what it's all about. Will the Lord be pleased with the thousands of rams and 10,000 rivers of oil? I mean, if I give him all this stuff, will that make it, God happy? The implication is no, that's not what it's all about. Shall I offer my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? Implied no. And then verse eight, which we read earlier. He has shown you, O mortal, what is good. And what, the Lord, what does the Lord require of you? To act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. That's the heart of God. To be just and do what is right and fair. To be merciful, because you receive mercy in Jesus. We're told to forgive others as God in Christ has forgiven us. That's tough, because God in Christ has forgiven us everything. And to walk humbly with God. The people of the northern kingdom and any people in the southern kingdom in the ancient world, they were pridefully walking. They had made their own places of worship, their own temples. They were worshiping false gods. They were sacrificing their own children to pagan gods. They were not caring for the poor. And God says, walk humbly with me. Follow my ways. And as I think about it, I think about, okay, so, so if Micah said, hey, let's talk. You know, if you could sit down face to face with this prophet, and if Micah was to distill down uh, just, to, just to a couple of simple lessons. You know, what, would, what would Micah say? What would Micah communicate to you and to me in, in just a simple conversation? And, and here's some of the things that come through the heart of the scriptures, and I believe that he would say to you and me. Number one, what would the prophet say to you? Speak the truth with passion and power and humility. I think that Micah would say, listen, in every generation it's hard to speak the truth, but speak the truth. Parents, Speak the truth to your children. Don't talk about, oh, my truth and your truth. There is truth. It's not relativism. It's not whatever you want it to be. Truth is truth. And even though our world tries to bend that, it's a lie. Husbands and wives, speak the truth to each other. Friends, speak the truth to each other. The people who love me the most will speak truth to me. They'll do it with grace, but they'll speak the truth. I think Micah would say, this is the heart of God, that we would be tenacious, truth-telling Christians because Jesus Christ is the truth and we have the truth. What would the prophet say to you and to me if he could talk with us? I know he would say this. Hope is closer than you think. Hope is closer than you think. A lot of people today live their life hopeless, relationally hopeless, financially hopeless, you know, uh, in, in their own emotionally hopeless, occupationally hopeless. They look down the road and they say, I don't see something better. There's a chronic reality in our world of young people right now taking their lives. Young people taking their lives because they see no hope. 
And Micah would say, even in the darkest of times, there is a hope. His name is Jesus. And Micah got to look forward to Jesus. We get to look back. We know he came. He lived. He died. He rose again. He gave his life on the cross. And Micah would say, whatever you're going through, no matter how dark it is, there is hope. Hold on to Jesus. Strive for Jesus. And that would lead to the third thing that Micah would say to you and to me. When the Messiah comes, embrace him. And when others need him, share freely. Micah would say, listen, I stood 740 years before the Messiah came. I, I just knew that in Bethlehem the Messiah would come. I didn't know when it was. I, I mean, he stood looking, someday the Messiah will come. But Micah would say, you're on the other side of Bethlehem. The Messiah came. Jesus gave his life. He paid the price. If you know him, if you love him, he fills you. And I think Micah would say, you know the Messiah, so hold to him whatever you go through. Hold on to Jesus and hold on tight because he loves you and he is there for you. And I think Micah would say this too. If you meet somebody who doesn't know this savior of the world, this one born in Bethlehem, tell people. Share about Jesus. That's why we go to all the trouble we do every year to put on this organic outreach conference, to equip you and people from around the world who come in to naturally share the story of Jesus. Micah would say, make that part of your lifestyle. And then a fourth thing that Micah would say, he would say this, don't be content with religious routines, but live a radical life of faith. I think Micah would say, listen, <clears throat> An hour a week is not enough. <laughs> it's, not, it's not that you, I mean, offerings are fine, and that's a good thing to do, but, it, but it's, it, your life is not just about, I showed up to church for an hour, I put something in the offering plate, I shook a few hands, and I went home. Micah would say, our faith is about all day, every day. If you're a follower of Jesus, if you know his heavenly Father, th then you know this call to do justice, live a life where you do what is right to love mercy, to show compassion and mercy in every situation you walk into. And then to walk humbly with God, to make sure that when you, each day that you know where you're going, and the lights are on, you can go there. There you go. Thank you. I was gonna say it because I wasn't gonna act like nobody noticed, right? But, but to say, I know where I'm going, and I know where God's called me, and I'm going to walk humbly with God, which means humbly walking with God is saying, I'm going to go where God calls me to go. I'm going to do what God calls me to do, because that's how we live our lives as followers of Jesus. And we shine his light by doing what's right and just and good and beautiful, by showing mercy by walking with God. Well, Shoreline as a congregation, that's the journey we're on. We're seeking to walk with God and live for God and to seek his face. And a couple of years ago, as a congregation, and I, I was so proud of our church, I continue to be so proud of Shoreline Church, we looked and we actually said as a congregation and our leadership team said, listen, I, we, we believe that this church can do more for the glory of God. We can show more justice, we can show more mercy, we can walk more closely with God. And so we came and we challenged Shoreline Church to pray more, to serve more, to give more, and, and to pour yourselves out, to go beyond us, to make a difference right here to the ends of the earth. And we started this journey called, you know, and, and just stepping out in faith. And we invited everyone here. Will you pray more? Will you serve more? Will you give more? And there's things we've been doing the last two years because of that. Because of your prayers, because of your service, because of your giving. And I want to just share with you some of the things that have happened here because you took a challenge and stretched yourself. And many of you, in different ways, said, I'm going I'm to just try to be more generous for the sake of bringing God's love to the world. So just, I want to run through, I want you to just get an update and know what God's been doing through you and continues to do. So we, the first thing we said was this. We said, what's God saying to Shoreline Community Church? We're called to fortify our home base so we can serve Jesus until he returns. That God's given us this place here on, on Garden Road, and this is our home base, so we need to make sure this is the place we can serve well for years to come. So we've done some things with the money you gave towards call. Like, if you didn't notice, new carpet. Can I get an amen? Um, People were tripping on the ripples in the carpet, you know? People were, and so, and so that, that, that's part of our journey forward is saying we want to make this a place. We said, listen, we've got young people in our church, and we don't have a space for our middle school and high school kids. We're going to create a space. So what you're going to see on the screen, this is our no youth room. Our grand opening is next Sunday. Next Sunday, walk through the youth room and look at it. But it is a beautiful place designed for students, for them to be able to invite their friends, and we, because we want the next generation to love Jesus, Amen. So you gave and you served, and that's happened. Praise God for that. And then we said, we're going to need more space. 
So we looked, at, we looked at a massive building next to us that was available. And we thought that we were gonna be able to get that building and then maybe move into it with Trinity Christian High School renting half the building because we didn't need that much space and the whole bottom fell out and it didn't work out. And we said, but God's on the throne. So we waited. Trinity Christian High School found a wonderful school in New Monterey and they moved over there. And God provided for us next door, 2460 Garden, where the pictures you're seeing right there are our new building that we now own that belongs to Shoreline. So praise God for that. Thank you for making that happen. Yeah. And, and we're moving three of our departments over there. We're going to have a studio for doing video recording and different things that we do here to kind of communicate through the arts. And two-thirds of the building will still be rented by other people. And that'll help cover some of the bill. And then with time, if we need space, we'll kind of transition into that over time. But God gave us that space. It wasn't the one we thought, but it was the one we needed. And that's how God works. And then we said, we need more space for our children. We need to finish more of our children's space. And so the lighthouse room, which is now finished, and we've moved into that. We finished the children's space. And so praise God for that. So God, God has just provided. Then we said, listen, we need a place for new people to gather and for classes. Our Connections Cafe that you see there, we have got, we're designing plans right now. We'll keep you in the loop, but that's probably a few months away, but we're moving into, moving into that space with a new purpose so we can use it on Sundays and all week long. And then the courtyard, we now have a plan. There it is. We now have submitted those plans to the city. Yes, we have. Do we have a permit yet? No, no we're waiting. <laughs> it's up to Jesus and the city of Monterey. And so talk to, will you talk to Jesus about that? <laughs> and let's keep praying. But, but we, we, we have the money to begin that project and we're gonna, we'll keep you updated on it, but we're waiting. When, when they give us the permit, we start moving forward. And so when, when you see dirt moving, it means, because we're not doing anything without a permit. We tried that once, it didn't go well for us. And so we're not gonna do that again, all right? But, but, keep, but, but we're moving forward, so praise God for that. And then the hospitality center, where, where we do all, all of our refreshments, that's when the, when the courtyard's done, we'll get, we're ready to do that as well. So well, almost everything that we talked about, and the one thing I didn't mention, the roof, we had our rainiest year ever last year, it didn't leak. <laughs> Praise God. So we're not spending, we got, we're, we'll spend money when it starts to leak, but until then, we're going to keep praying, and trust we have uh, rain, but no leaky roof. And then we, we, as a church, we said, what's God saying to Shoreline Community Church? You're called to reach beyond yourselves. So we said, what about our community? We need to reach out more here. We started Love Our Central Coast. And, and the last two years, as part of Call, we've done Love Our, Love Our Central Coast, and we just did a recent one, over 900 volunteers from six different churches on 46 projects. And next year, it will be more because God said to us two years ago, I believe God said to us, you can do more for my glory. You can do more justice, show more mercy, and mock, walk more with me. And as we've done that, God has provided, and we're growing in our faith and growing in our impact for the glory of Jesus. And then we, God said to us, to Shoreline Church, you're called to share Jesus to the ends of the earth. So we started a new ministry in Guatemala. We're working with a hospital, Christian schools, and churches, and we're partnering in Guatemala. And that, we've got roots in there, and that is growing in the coming years. Some of you will be going on trips to Guatemala, sharing in that ministry. So we have a new ministry in Guatemala because of your generosity, because of your prayers, because of your serving. And then we said, we're going to start Organic Outreach International. We're going to start a ministry training local churches to share Jesus naturally. And we committed to that, having no idea what would happen. Right now, and I'm not exaggerating, right now through our training and our resources, which are online for free because of your generosity, Three years of training materials for any church in the world. It's all now online in English and all in Spanish. And we're doing six trainings in India in January. We've done two trainings in the Ukraine. We've done training in New Zealand and Australia. God has taken us all over the world. And right now we're impacting through the leaders we're training over 23,000 churches around the world who are being taught, you don't just go in, in, in and take care of yourselves. You go out with the love of Jesus. You do justice, show mercy, and you walk with God and you share Jesus. You are part of that. Praise God. That's your church. Yeah. And then in our, on our journey, we also uh, looked and said, right around us here, what can we do to expand? So we looked at Pacific Grove. And we said, can we start a campus in Pacific Grove? And that was part of our journey of call. And Pastor Nate and I uh, stood here together earlier and, and shared some of the story of Pacific Grove and what's happening there. So I want you to watch the video of 830 service. And Pastor Nate and I sharing with the congregation. So go ahead and watch this. Watch the screens. A month ago, God was doing a, a, a stirring in, in my heart and in my soul as I, as I pray all the time for, for our Pacific Grove campus and for Shoreline at large. Uh, in, in a matter of eight days, uh, five of my 10 core team leaders, these are leaders that are mostly volunteer, leading ministries who love Shoreline Church, specifically PG and that community to reach it, 
came to me and, and shared some hard news. It, within eight days, I got an email, I got a phone call, and I got an email saying, because of life stuff, because someone lost a job, and they need to find another job, and they're feeling called out of the area, because of, uh, because they need to get another job, another couple said we need to get another job and it's pulling them away and, and not available for, for the weekend. And because of, of, of family stuff with, with kiddos and it's just a lot of driving and they feel like they wanna be more in tune and plugged in with the Monterey campus and the thriving youth culture here, um, they're gonna have to step down from ministry. Big deal. That's a big, those, those are my friends. Those five have been with us from the very beginning. And so I started praying and I said, Kevin, uh, help me on this. You're, you're my brother, you're the lead pastor. What do you, what do you think about this? What are you feeling? Because I was feeling it deeply. Uh, and I didn't know exactly what that meant. So. And so at the same time, I'm, as the lead pastor, looking at called and knowing we have two more months of called and people are still giving towards it for the next two months and then knowing that at the end of those, those two years, our financial reality will change because there were special commitments made. My wife and I made a commitment to call that we can't sustain that level of giving. We're gonna give more than we gave before. We can't give it at that level indefinitely. So some of that giving is gonna go away. And we're looking at, at you know, uh, Love Our Central Coast and Guatemala and Pacific Grove and Organic Outreach International saying, can we sustain all of these ministries at the same level we have been? And so I said to Nate, man, one of the questions we're asking is, which of our ministries are thriving and growing and which of them are doing good but maybe not totally thriving and maybe at a type, type where we say, maybe, maybe it's time to transition that ministry and end that ministry. And then, and then Nate was dealing with the issue of that we had set markers or kind of benchmarks for each of our ministries and in Pacific Grove, we had four big markers that we said, here's the things we wanna see happen after two years to know that it's thriving and we can continue forward. And so just share what, what we had kind of talked yeah. about years ago. Yeah, four markers. And, and these are really kind of benchmarks that we said, I mean, how do we know if the campus is thriving? How do we know if we're going the right direction? That's important, right? And so I just wanna be very honest with you and let you know that uh, marker number one, before we even launched was, was to find a permanent facility. Because in Pacific Grove, the last uh, small town of America, right, you need to plant deep roots. And having a permanent facility allows you to plant deep roots. We haven't found a permanent facility yet. Not because we haven't been praying. I believe you and me. We've been praying. Uh, there are challenges with being a church in a box in a way, being, being, being mobile. And, and, so, and not because we, we're saying we're not going to throw money at it. We, we are. We, just, we're, we need the right space. And the right space hasn't come up. Okay, let's be honest about that. Marker number two is that we would have two services at some point because a healthy church culture is one that where volunteers can come and they can receive and they can grow, but they can also serve. So attend one, serve one. We're not there yet. We're just partly, largely due to the facility. It holds 500 people. And when it's cold there, it's really cold. And those chairs are made for third grade butts. You know, like it's, <laughs> it's difficult, but we're not there yet. We're just, we're not. And that breaks my heart because, because when people are serving, they don't get to go to church. MPG, and, and that's a big deal. Marker number three is that f finances. Uh, we gotta be honest with where we at with, with our finances. And we wanna be financially self-sufficient as a campus so that Monterey campus doesn't have to, have to float us. We're not there yet. We're not even halfway there yet. We gotta be honest. And the fourth one that I felt like we could really hang our hat on is thriving volunteer teams, especially the core team. That was true. We are, we are in the trenches. We are serving with all our heart. And then four weeks ago, three and a half weeks ago, I found out that half my team is going for very good reasons. Not because they're indifferent about the vision or the leader or the, uh, the philosophy of ministry. No, no, no. They actually all came to me and said, we don't want to go. But we feel like we need to because of X, Y, and Z. And so yeah. that yeah. was the reality. Yeah. And so what churches are famous for doing is churches are famous for doing something and then keep doing it forever because you just do, even if it's not moving the direction you want to go. So here's the reality. Pacific Grove, we've seen 23 people put their faith in Jesus for the first time yeah. through Pacific Grove. Yeah. And yeah. 13 people be baptized. So God has done a great work there, done a mighty work, and lives have been touched. But we're looking forward and saying, okay, we scattered the seed in different places in Guatemala, around the world with Organic Outreach International and Pacific Grove. We scattered seed, and we saw what, which ones are really thriving and growing. And of all the different things that we launched with called, the one that has been probably the toughest soil, mm -hmm. and it's not for a lack of farming and trying and watering mm -hmm. and working hard, but we're just saying it's not bearing the fruit that we, that we were looking for. And so we sat down and we talked and prayed with the management team. We pulled, invited the leadership team in and we talked and prayed and said, okay, is this God's timing that we would say we launched Pacific Grove, it had a great ministry for two years, and we closed down the campus of Pacific Grove. Now, all of the resources that we'd say, all the, the people would come to Monterey and all of the resources, the sound equipment would be used, the, 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 the trailers would be used for different ministries. The staff comes, with, <laughs> comes back to Monterey and we don't lose any of them. And we say, okay, instead of you know, doing our outreach in two locations, 
We just bring it back into one for a season. We prayed about it, talked about it, and that's where we came down. Yeah. And I, I actually said to Nate, I said, Nate, with the idea of coming on the Monterey campus and helping us start new communities, and we're gonna continue to minister. We've got, I think, 12 growth groups in Pacific mm -hmm. Grove. Those are gonna continue. People in Pacific Grove are still part of Shore, and it'll just be, uh, the only difference is we won't have a Sunday service in Pacific Grove. It'll be here together. And we worked through this, prayed through it, and that's the conclusion we came to. Mm -hmm. And we want to let you know that as a team, because when we launch new things and we invest in things, we're like, we're excited, we want to do this. And here's what I hit, hit me just, I think, two mornings ago. I was on my knees praying, and I said, Lord, you know, as we're going to share with the congregation, did, I said, did we do the right thing? And this is what God put on my heart. We started the campus in Pacific Grove at just the right time, mm -hmm. and it honored God. And we're gonna close it at just the right time, and that honors God too. Because things have a life cycle, they have a season. And our ministry there continues. And actually I asked Nate, we're looking at Nate being part of starting new, multiple new communities and different ministries here and all around our communities. And Nate said to me the other day, he said, I wonder if we could reach more people for Jesus and minister to more people by this new model than where we're at. And I said, well, if this is what God's leading us to do, I think that's what God's gonna do. Yeah. So here's what I wanna do. At Pacific Grove, right now, Pastor Nate's gonna stand up. It's like magic. He's there with you. Next service, he's gonna be there. So have a fun time talking with Pastor Nate. And Nate, would you just pray and close this part yeah. of our service? God, I, I, I praise you that uh, just through the story and the message and the lessons we can learn from Micah are relevant for us today. That, that we are called to, uh, to be truth bearers and truth sharers. And that's what we wanna do. And we wanna be honest about what you're doing in our lives. And there are seasons of ministry, and, and even though Shoreline PG is coming to an end, God, I have great hope for what you're gonna continue to do. This is hard, I've poured my life into this, yes. but God, I believe that you're, you're not closing down the church in PG. We're not abandoning Pacific Grove. We're actually motivated by the new vision that you're giving to us to continue to be a part of reaching. There, the, there is so much more that needs to be done. God, I thank you that you are empowering us and giving us inspiration to go even further and deeper. So help us in that. We pray this in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Amen. I want to let you know as a congregation that I am so proud of a church that will keep trying new things to grow believers, to glorify God, and to reach the world. And we're not going to stop. God's going to keep stretching us.